If you Google the John Goodman Health Policy blog, you're going to discover two things. Uh, first, you're going to discover that this is about the only health policy blog that approaches health policy from an economic point of view. All of our main bloggers believe that the reason we're having the problems we're having in healthcare are because people face perverse economic incentives. And when they act on those incentives, they do things that make costs higher, quality lower, and access more difficult than otherwise would have been the case. The second thing you're going to discover is that this is the only health policy blog of any persuasion whatever that has a sense of humor. I don't know what it is about the field that I'm in, but it's dominated by a bunch of sourpusses. And uh, many of them not only have no sense of humor, they don't even know when I'm joking. I'm including here Paul Krugman at the New York Times. And um, you know, you can get in real trouble if, if you're trying to be not serious and other people think you are. So we created this, uh, this yield sign for the humor challenge. It's a, it's, a, it's a satire alert. So when people like Krugman see a comment, you know, we have that little symbol there to, to alert him, but not to take everything totally seriously on that particular blog post. But we feel like if we can't make you smile at least once a day at the blog, we're, we're not doing our job. We uh, had a post the other day on how Obamacare is going to push all of us into HMOs, how we're going to have our health care rationed, and then we went over to YouTube and got Aretha Franklin singing Say a Little Prayer for You. <laughs> and uh, then we had a post on end of life care and we had Bob Dylan singing Knocking on Heaven's Door. <laughs> we had this um, incredible exchange between the insurance uh, company guys and the doctors and it went back and forth and back and forth for 50 or 60 comments and uh, at one point it got really heated and this one doctor got so exasperated he said you insurance guys are killing our patients. So I thought that was kind of interesting so I reposted some of those comments and then under that last one I had Leslie Gore singing you'd cry too if it happened to you. <laughs> We're sometimes accused of being um, insensitive and irreverent and I guess the worst thing we ever did happened two years ago when a man walked into the Parkland Memorial Hospital emergency room in Dallas, Texas, and he waited 19 hours and died before he ever saw a doctor. And we thought this was pretty tragic, and we also thought this, this could happen in other cities, not just Dallas, so we did a little post on it. Uh, but underneath that, we had Lionel Richie singing all night long, and that probably was insensitive on our part. <laughs> By the way, if you... Um, are not getting health alerts uh, from me. If you're going to come to conferences like this, if you're this interested in public policy, you need to get the health alerts. And they come out Monday and, and Wednesday, and then they'll take you back to our blog. Uh, the blogosphere is where the public, real public policy debate is right now. You know, every place else you look, you, you watch you know, Sunday morning news shows, watch C-SPAN, what's happening in Congress, people are just talking past each other. They're just reading off uh, talking points. But in the blogosphere, uh, there's real intellectual exchange. Right now, the, lib the leading liberal healthcare blog, which is the Incidental Economist, which is linked with the Washington Post, is reviewing my new book, Priceless. First time they reviewed any book. And they're going chapter by chapter, and they're being very respectful, and they're finding a lot in the book that they like. So uh, it, um, it really is a place uh, where you can engage other people, uh, not always in a respectful way, but at least that site is, is respectful. Now, when I talk, I usually have my cell phone with me. Because you never know, you know, even in the middle of a speech, when there could be an emergency, right? That was not serious. <laughs> uh, this is serious. Uh, there are more cell phones in the United States than there are people. Now, even the panhandler down on the street corner probably has a cell phone. But he probably doesn't have very good access to health care. If something goes wrong with my cell phone, in Dallas, Texas, there are a dozen shops that I can walk into without any appointment. I can get prompt service, low cost service, high quality service um, very easily. Uh, there are even shops that will send someone to my condominium and repair my iPhone in my home. Uh, there's a national chain, it's called iHospital, and the employees are called iDoctors. <laughs> but um, if something happens to me, did you know the average wait in the United States for a patient to see a new doctor is three weeks? In Boston, where we're told they have universal coverage, the average wait is two months. And did you know that one out of every five individuals who enters a hospital emergency room leaves without ever seeing a doctor because they just get tired of waiting? So my question to you is why is the market so kind to my iPhone so mean to me? And I believe the answer is that this iPhone is bought and sold and repaired in a real market with real prices 
where entrepreneurs know if they solve our problems, they can make millions of dollars. Whereas over in healthcare, we have so suppressed the market year after year, decade after decade, that no one ever sees a real price for anything. No patient, no doctor, no employee, uh, no employer. We have completely bought in to the same notion that has dominated the healthcare systems of all other developed countries. We like to think that we're really different from Canada and Britain, but we're not. We're far more similar than we are different. And we bought into the idea that if you want to make healthcare accessible, it's got to be free at the point of delivery. Um, and what we have forgot when we do that is when you completely suppress the price, you elevate the importance of all the non-price barriers to care. In this country, we are not primarily paying for care with money. We are paying with time, just as they do in Canada and Britain and all over Europe. Some of you may not have noticed, but when you go to see a lawyer or an accountant or an architect or an engineer or any other professional, that office out, outer office area, it's called a reception area, not a waiting room. <laughs> now, what do I mean by non-price barriers to care? I mean, how long does it take a patient to get on the phone with your office and make an appointment to see you? And then how many days does that patient have to wait until they actually get to see you? And then how long does it take them to come from their home or their office to your office and then back again? And then once you're at their, your office, how long do they have to wait before they get to see you? Those are all non-price barriers to health care. And there's lots and lots of evidence, which I'll be happy to talk to you about if you'd like, that those non-price barriers are more important obstacles to health care than the fee that the doctor charges. Leave that, okay. Um, we have in this country almost um, 50 million people who are on food stamps. People on food stamps can walk into any supermarket that you and I walk into. They can buy almost any product you and I can buy. They pay the same price you and I pay. Uh, they go to the checkout stand, they put the food stamps down, they put money on top, they consummate their transaction. And you never, never hear it said that low-income people in this country have a lack of access to supermarkets. I mean, the worst that can happen is they have to get on a bus and, and, and go a mile to get to the supermarket. But you never hear of a supermarket saying, we're not taking any more food stamp customers, right? That just doesn't happen. But what's happening over in healthcare? In healthcare, we have about 60 million people on Medicaid, and mainly they're the same people as the people who have food stamps. And what's the biggest problem that the Medicaid folks have? They can't find a doctor who's willing to see them. You know, I was in Massachusetts not so long ago, and as often happens when I'm in another city, I struck up a conversation with a female cab driver, and I said, well, how's Romney Care working for you? And she said, well, you know, my biggest problem is finding a doctor. And I said, well, tell me about this. And she said, um, well, I had to go down a list of, she's on uh, uh, Massachusetts uh, Medicaid, which is called Mass Health. Okay. So she says, I had to go down a list of 20 names before I could find a doctor who would see me. And I said, were you going down the yellow pages? And she says, no, no, I was going down the list that Mass Health gave me. That's, that's what universal health care means in, in Massachusetts. Um, what happens? when Medicaid patients can't find doctors who will see them. They go to community health centers. They go to emergency rooms uh, like Parkland Hospital in Dallas, where the average wait's not 19 hours, but it wouldn't be unusual to find waits of four, five, and six hours, uh, depending on the day. And if you walked in Parkland with a migraine headache, you might well wait eight hours before anybody ever saw you. And that's what's happening over in healthcare. Now, interestingly, at the same time all this is going on, we're getting this proliferation of the walk-in clinics. And I think all of you know about them. You see them in Walmart and you see them in shopping centers and in the CVS pharmacy. They're called minute clinics. And the name minute clinic implies that they know your time is valuable as well as your money. Uh, this care is, of course, delivered by nurses. They're following computerized protocols. They follow those protocols more consistently, by the way, than traditional primary care physicians. So they're providing good, routine, high-quality care for the kinds of services that they offer. Doctors don't usually like me to talk about the minute clinics and nurses delivering care. But you know, if it weren't for Pete Stark and the irrational restrictions they impose on you, I think doctors would form financial relationships with the walk-in clinics because, after all, when the nurses see problems they can't handle, they've got to refer them somewhere. And so why not form financial relationships with people who have competencies that are greater than they have? But the problem for low-income folks is that in Dallas, Texas, 
The Minute Clinic charges about $75 if you have a sore throat or an earache. But Medicaid only pays about half that amount. So none of the Minute Clinics or other walk-in clinics in Dallas are seeing any of the Medicaid patients. That's generally true across the whole country. We could greatly expand access for basic primary care just overnight if we would just change the rules and allow low-income folks to purchase health care the same way they purchase food. And by the way, <laughs> thank you, I wouldn't just limit it to the minute clinics, I would expand it to the whole market. They should be able to pay you the market price that you're charging, and uh, that's one of the arguments we make in, in our book, Prices. Um, if we want to solve our nation's health care problems, we've got to liberate patients. And liberating patients means liberating them from the kinds of silly restrictions that low-income people face today on Medicaid. And the second thing we've got to do is liberate the doctors. Doctors are the only professionals in our society who are not free to repackage and reprice what they offer to the market. Every other professional, the lawyers, the accountants, the engineers, the architects, every one of them, if demand changes, if technology changes, if anything changes, they can repackage what they're offering to the market, they can reprice it just like that. But you cannot. You are completely subservient to a third-party payer system in which you're virtually dictated what you're going to do, what you're going to get paid for, and what you're not going to get paid for. Uh, back to my cell phone for just a second. Every other professional I know uses this all the time. It's a very convenient way to talk to clients. And all of you know why doctors don't use this, right? Okay. Because of the 7,500 tasks that Medicare pays doctors to perform, this basically isn't on the list, or it's not on the list in a convenient way, right? And with the third party payers pushing down on you and squeezing you in every direction, how many non-billable hours can you afford to spend uh, doing things you don't uh, get paid for? Uh, everybody is emailing everybody these days. Even the corner liquor store emails me if they have a bottle of wine they know I like. Um, but I don't get an email from my doctor. Interestingly, I do get an email from the Minute Clinic. Uh, they emailed me in August, said, it's, it's school time. Uh, do you, have your kids had their vaccinations? And I got one just last month saying, oh, by the way, it's flu time. Have you got your flu shot yet? But I don't get emails from doctors because, again, <laughs> Of the 7,500 things that Medicare pays doctors to do, uh, basically the email is just not on the list, or it's not on the list in a way that makes it practical. And there are a lot of other things that, uh, that Medicare doesn't pay doctors to do. One of the worst ways to pay a professional is to have a list and prices next to the list, because once you do that, everything you didn't think of, everything you didn't put on that list is going to be things that the providers don't do, or they won't do them very often. I think you all, and by you all I mean the whole profession, has done a terrible job of explaining to patients and to the public what kind of problems, how it's bad for them to pay you in this way. Uh, when I explain it, I use real simple examples like telephone and email because I know that people can relate to that and, uh, and I know they can understand it. But basically the public doesn't understand the problems that you're dealing with that are different from other professionals. Uh, one example I like is the example of Dr. Jeffrey Brenner, and anybody ever heard of him? Hot spots? Okay, some of you have. Gwandi wrote this article in New Yorker about him, and you may, uh, that may turn you off because Gwandi's a supporter of Obamacare. Um, but Gwandi doesn't understand economics, he doesn't understand Obamacare. But what he had to say about Brenner was really interesting. Uh, Jeffrey Brenner's in Camden, New Jersey, which I'm told is one of the poorest places in the whole United States. Uh, people in Camden either are, are they're on Medicare, or they're on Medicaid, or they're uninsured. Hardly anybody has private insurance. Uh, Brenner is an entrepreneur, he's a scientist, he's a researcher. He begins looking through the hospital records, and he discovers that 1% of everybody living in Camden is spending 30% of the hospital's money. So 1% generates 30% of the cost. So he went down the list of the one, and he discovers this one man, one of the worst cases. This man weighs 600 pounds. Uh, he's an alcoholic. He's a drug addict. He's a diabetic. Uh, he spends half the year in the hospital. And when he's not in the hospital, he's abusing himself. So Brenner takes this guy and, under his wing, and he gets him off the drugs, and he gets him off the alcohol. Uh, he enrolls him in AA. He discovers the guy's a Christian. So he gets him going to church. 
Uh, then he enrolls him in some welfare programs so he can have some financial stability in his life. And pretty soon, this individual is not going into the hospital anymore. And because he's not going to the hospital anymore, his medical costs are going down, down, down. Saving money for, the, saving hardly any money for the patient, but saving lots of money for taxpayers. Uh, Brenner tells me he can go down the streets of Camden and po point to whole buildings and tell you how much that whole building is costing Medicare and Medicaid. And after his success with this one patient, he formed a clinic and he started doing these sorts of things with more, uh, uh, more patients. In fact, right now today he's saving millions of dollars for taxpayers uh, through this kind of work. Now let me ask you this question. Uh, in return for all the millions of dollars that Brenner and his colleagues are saving Medicare, how much do you think Medicare gives Brenner? Oh, that's very good. You all understand this system very well. Um, you see, most of what Brenner is doing is social work. And social work is just another thing that's really not on the list of, of things that Medicare pays for. It's not on the list of 7,500 tasks. Even though this, these particular activities that Brenner is engaged in are saving us all lots of money. And for Medicaid, for all the millions he's saving them, how much do you think Medicare gave, Medicaid gives him? Again, zero. At my blog, I said we should allow Brenner to become a millionaire. You know, if he saves the system a dollar, let's give him 20 cents. Uh, I tried to sell the Bush folks when they were in power on this idea, and they thought it was the most radical thing they'd ever heard of. You know, why should we give Brenner anything? He's already doing this for free. <laughs> and I said, because if you start paying Brenner money, if you, if you show people that you can make a lot of money by solving problems, and then you tell all the other doctors in America about it, uh, then they'll come forth and say, look, you know, we can think of ways, too, to save money for the system and, and reduce costs and improve quality. We want to be paid in a different way, too. And then you open your door and you let the providers solve the problems instead of thinking you can solve them all from Washington, which you cannot. Uh, well, the Bush people, that was just way too radical for them. They, they did not know how radical things were going to get because uh, they didn't anticipate Obamacare. But, uh, of course, the whole attitude of the Obama administration is no good idea starts out in the hinterland. You know, they all have to come from Washington. So President Obama has told you how he views health care. You may not remember it, but he's told you more than once. He said, we're going to go out and find out what works, and we're going to copy it. Right? We're going to run the pilot programs, the demonstration projects. Um, that's exactly what he says about education as well. The only difference is we've been trying to do that in education for 25 years with no success. And in health care, we've only been doing it for four or five years with no success. Uh, and there's not going to be any success. The Congressional Budget Office has looked at these pilot programs on three separate occasions and find, found that the pay for performance, coordinated care, integrated care, electronic medical records, every time they've looked at it, this is, this is not saving money. And if it's not saving money, there's little chance that we're going to successfully copy it and save money. We need to liberate the doctors, and finally, we need to liberate the entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm often asked if free markets can work in healthcare. And my quick response to that is the only place in healthcare where things are working is where the market is allowed to be free. And by that I mean where the third party payers aren't. Show me a healthcare market where there's no Blue Cross, no Medicare, no employer, and I'll show you a market that's probably working pretty well. Uh, looking around this room, uh, I would guess that most of you don't know much about the market for cosmetic surgery. But give it another decade or so, and uh, even you all will get interested in it. In, in any event, here's a market where there aren't any third-party payers. Uh, you're all paying with your own money, and uh, you get package prices that covers the doctor, the nurse, the necessities, the facility. But you know what you're going to pay before you, you go in. And you can compare prices, and there's price competition. Uh, over the last 15 years, uh, there's been a five, six, seven hundred percent increase in all the procedures. It's just really booming. All kinds of technological change of the type that we're told increases cost everywhere else in healthcare. And yet in this market, the real price of cosmetic surgery keeps going down, down, down steadily for 15 years. LASIK surgery, same thing. You have complete transparency. You have price competition. You have quality competition. You have package prices. Uh, you have all kinds of technological change, huge increase in the number of procedures, and yet over the last decade, the real price of LASIK surgery has come down by 25%. Um, I can point to many, many examples, and I do this in the book Prices, where, where, wherever people on the provider side are dealing with people spending their own money 
Markets work really, really well. Teladoc of Dallas uh, does give the patient telephone consultations. Uh, I'm in a different city. I can call up and um, for $30. <laughs> I get a doctor on the phone, he pulls up my medical records, he sees what's happening, he can fill a prescription. Um, there are two million customers of Teladoc, and they're growing very fast, catering to patients basically outside the traditional insurance system. Uh, Rx.com was the first mail order uh, pharmacy, uh, mail order pharmacy online, designed to compete with local pharmacies. For whom? Not for Blue Cross but for people who are paying for drugs out of pocket and who are very price sensitive. So again and again and again, there's the market for international tourism. There is a growing market, as the Medibid people know, for domestic medical tourism. Uh, all of this showing that markets work well when we deal with people paying their own money and the third party payers are not in the way. Uh, all of this, however, is threatened by Obamacare. And I want to just real quickly go over the six worst things about Obamacare, and by the worst things, I mean there are six problems are so bad that even if the Republicans all go home, uh, the Democrats who are left in Washington are going to have to deal with these problems and are going to want to deal with them before 2014. And the first is that all of you are going to be required to buy an insurance package whose cost is going to grow at twice the rate of growth of your income. President Obama didn't create this problem. This has been going on for 40 years. Uh, for the last four decades, healthcare spending has been growing at twice the rate of growth of our income. It's not a uniquely American problem. Uh, we're not the worst. In fact, we're sort of in the middle of the pack among developed countries. But you don't have to be an economist or a mathematician. You don't need a pocket calculator to know that if something is growing at twice the rate of growth of your income, it's going to be crowding out everything else that you consume. Uh, and in fact, if we continue on this path, by the time today's college students reach the retirement age, uh, healthcare will have crowded out everything else. They'll have nothing to eat, nothing to wear, no place to live, but they have lots and lots of healthcare. All right. Um, again, the president didn't create this problem, but the healthcare plan is going to lock us onto the path. It's going to make it more difficult to deal with it because. What would you do normally if you had insurance premiums rising faster than your income? You would go to, to, to a smaller package of benefits. You'd have, choose a higher deductible. You're going to be limited in those kinds of responses. Second problem is a bizarre system of subsidies. Uh, I don't know if you've thought about it, but most of the hotels you go into, if you look around, most of the people you see are making about $15 an hour. You know, the maids, the waitresses, the waiters, the busboys, the custodial people. And they're making about $30,000 a year. Uh, this hotel and the other hotels is going to be required under the law to provide those employees with health insurance that's really quite expensive. And for the family coverage, it's going to cost about $15,000. So here you have somebody making 30. The health insurance costs half his wages. I can see the meeting now with employees. We've got bad news. We've got good news. The bad news is we're going to cut your wages in half. The good news is you get Obamacare. Now. There is nothing, nothing in this legislation which gives any extra help to the hotel or to the employees. But if there is a way for the hotel not to provide insurance for these employees, then they go over into this new health insurance exchange, and there they will get this same health insurance package almost totally paid for by Uncle Sam. They only have to pay 2%, the government pays the other 98%. So over here they get $13,000, $14,000 benefit for free, and over here, it's going to have to come out of their wages. So where do you think they're going to end up? For the higher income people, say there's a, a manager making $100,000, he gets no help if he goes over into the exchange. There's no subsidy for him. But if he continues to get health insurance from the employer, uh, those premium dollars escape, say, a 25% uh, uh, federal income tax, a 15% FICA tax, a, a 5 6% state and local income tax. I guess here in this state, it can be as high as 10 10 percent, right? So basically, uh, for that, that guy, uh, the uh, government is paying for half the cost of his insurance just through those tax subsidies. So what we're going to get is higher income people and their employers are going to want to keep health insurance at work and lower income people, below average wage folks, are going to want to get over into health insurance exchange. I don't know how it will happen. Uh, maybe the hotel makes all these people part-time workers. 
Maybe it makes them all independent contractors. Maybe the hotel divides in two and, and, and one company hires below average wage workers and doesn't provide health insurance and maybe pays a fine, which would be much less than the benefit they're going to get. And the other company hires the higher income workers and provides health insurance. I do know this, that it's gonna be really terrible if the entire industrial structure of the United States changes in that way just in response to health insurance subsidies. Because we want those kinds of decisions to be made on economic grounds if we want to compete successfully in the international marketplace, not in response to health insurance subsidies. The third problem is the health insurance exchange itself. And at the NCPA, we're about the only ones talking about this. But to me, it's just common sense. If you're an insurer and you have to charge the same premium to all comers, regardless of their health, expected health costs, uh, you don't have to think very long about that to realize you're going to make a profit on healthy people and losses on sick people. And I guarantee you the insurance guys don't think very long in order to know that. Uh, and I'll tell you something else. The bad incentives, perverse incentives, don't, don't stop at the point of enrollment. Once, once people enroll, the incentive for the plan will be to overprovide to the healthy because they want to keep the ones they have and uh, attract more of them and underprovide to the sick because uh, they didn't want the ones they have, and they certainly don't want to attract any more of them. I wonder if uh, you all have ever noticed the difference between casual insurance, the ads you see on TV and in magazines, and health insurance. What you see on TV is the ad where the black actor is standing in front of the town that's been destroyed, and he says it took two minutes for this town to be destroyed, and then he says, You're, are you in good hands, right? That's the Allstate ad. Uh, every Aflac ad you see, uh, the duck is running around, uh, things are going bad. <laughs> uh, the Chubb ad is my favorite print ad where the guy is going backwards over Niagara Falls in the boat and uh, he says uh, insurance doesn't matter till it does. What all those ads are communicating to you is this message, that we, don't not, we know you don't care about a health insurance, we know you, you don't care about insurance until something really bad happens and when the bad thing happens, we're going to be there for you, right? That's the message. Now over in Washington DC, the federal employees are in an exchange which is very much like an Obamacare exchange. And they get to choose a new plan every year at the end of the year in open season. And there are advertisements for the federal employees. And they appear in the Hill and the Washington Post and other places where uh, other publications that the federal employees read and on TV. And what do those ads do? Well, they never, never talk about what can go wrong in healthcare. They never mention cancer or heart disease or AIDS. They never mention any real important reason why anyone would ever want to have health insurance. Instead, what those ads do is they picture young, healthy families. And the implicit message is if you look like the families in this photo, then you're the kind of person we want in our plan. And if you don't look like them, we're not sure this is gonna be a good fit for us. Um, what I'm describing to you is the difference between an insurance market that works and one that doesn't. Uh, the fourth problem is on the buyer side. So we just had a Supreme Court case on the mandate and uh, we went back and forth and a lot of people felt like that decision was really important. But the fact of the matter is this is a very weak mandate. I mean the fine is small. Uh, the IRS can't seize your assets. It can't garnish your wages if you don't, if you don't buy the insurance. All it can do is withhold your refund. So it's a weak penalty. It's going to be weakly enforced. The IRS said that the other day they have really no plans to go out and enforce this mandate. And so what that tells me is that on the buyer side, people will have perverse incentives. And their incentive will be to not insure while they're healthy, to wait until they get sick and have a problem, then go get the insurance, get their health care, get the bills paid, and then drop the insurance. In Massachusetts, these are called um, jumpers and dumpers. They jump in when they have a problem and they dump the plan after they get the bill paid. But if everybody does that, then we'll end up with the only people having health insurance are sick and have high health care costs. And if that happens, the cost of health insurance will be so high that the private insurers won't be able to stay in the market. We'll have destroyed the whole system. The fifth problem is that um, this bill way, way over promises. And here's something else no one is talking about. In another year and a half, we're gonna insure another 30 million people. If the economic studies are correct, these people will try to double their consumption of health care, And then all the rest of you will be forced to have more generous coverage than you now have. Uh, there's a whole long list of preventive services that everybody is going to have with no deductible, no copayment. 
And if we all go out and get these services that were promised, well, the economists at Duke University actually did a study of what it would take to supply all these preventive services, all these screenings, to the entire American population. And they concluded it would take the average primary care physician seven and a half hours of every working day. So basically what doctors would be doing is be, they'd be giving screenings and other tests to basically healthy people, and they'd have very little time to do anything else. Um, so what I'm describing to you is a huge potential increase in demand, but there's nothing in the legislation that increases supply. The same thing happened in Massachusetts. I remember Governor Romney telling me that once this plan was in place, this is several years ago, we wouldn't have people going to the emergency room for their care. They would go to the primary care physician where it's cost less and more, more appropriate. The trouble is that when they cut the number of uninsured in half, they didn't increase the doctors or the nurses or the clinics. So more people are going to hospital emergency rooms in Massachusetts today than before the health reform. Just as many or more people are going to the community health centers. There's been no change in where people are getting their health care. No change at all. And basically all we're doing is shuffling money around and causing the waiting lines to get longer. And that's going to happen nationwide. And what I tell folks about this is this. We're going to have a huge rationing problem. I usually ask the audiences if, how many have a concierge doctor. Uh, usually it's about 2, 3, 4 percent. I ask them, do you know what a concierge doctor is? Most of them do know what that is. And I said, well, you better think seriously about getting one. Because if you don't, you're going to wait a long time for your health care. But if you're willing to pay extra money, you can have same day service, next day service. You'll probably have a doctor who will talk to you on, on, by the telephone and, and through email. Um, but you're going to have to pay to, to get it. We're going to get two tier medicine. We're going to get it really quickly. And I'll tell you, every time a doctor leaves the system and becomes a concierge doctor following the normal model, now the most popular model, he's leaving 2,500 patients in traditional practice. He takes 500 with him, okay? Because for the kind of services he really wants to provide, he can only serve about five or 600 patients. But what happens to the 2,000 over here? Well, now their problem is worse. So the more doctors, the more primary care doctors that become concierge doctors, the worse the problem gets for everybody else, given the structure of the system. Uh, we're going to get two-tier medicine very quickly. And the final problem is with seniors. Uh, it really is true that we're paying for this legislation in large part by taking money out of Medicare. And what I mean by taking money out of Medicare is I mean squeezing all of you, because that's the only way they can do that. They're not allowed to do it in any other way. Uh, means pay less to doctors, pay less to hospitals. The administration has been very, very deceitful about all this. The chief actuary of Medicare has been very honest. So if you want to pick up the trustees report of Medicare, he tells you exactly what's going to happen, not, not in, in, in uh, reader-friendly language that most of you would like to see, but, but he lays it out. There's a graph there on what's going to happen to doctor's fees. And very soon, if we follow current law, Medicare fees will fall below Medicaid, and they just keep falling further and further behind Medicaid plus all the private payers. What that means is senior citizens are going to be less desirable than welfare mothers from a financial point of view to the medical community. And um, one thing uh, that I know is going to happen is that when seniors can't find a doctor who will see them, they're going to be complaining to the politicians. Koki Roberts said the other day on Sunday morning TV, this will never happen. Well, if this never happens, that means we never paid for Obamacare, and we're just going to have deficits that keep going forever. Anyway, these are huge, huge problems, and, uh, and, we, and, and we're not going to get away, uh, get away from them. So even if no Republicans are around, uh, the Democrats are going to have to do something. Uh, this summer, I went up and talked to the Republican doctors in the House and in the Senate. There are about 18 uh, in the House, I believe, two in the Senate, if I'm correct. And I gave them a health contract with America. And I, I said, look, look, we don't need a 2,700-page bill. We need a few concepts that people can understand. Uh, no one understands Obamacare. So you need, you need to have a, a legislative agenda that people can understand. And the first one was tax fairness. I said, we don't need a mandate. But we do need to take all the tax and spending subsidies which are terribly regressive and arbitrary and unfair, and we need to give every American the same deal. And I believe we can give adults a $2,500 refundable tax credit for private health insurance. I believe we can have $8,000 for a family of four. 
just to put this in perspective, uh, most of the big corporations are now spending $16,000 on family coverage. The tax credit would be half that. So the tax credit would pay for, and this is refundable, so even if you don't owe income taxes, you would get it. But the 8,000 would pay for the core insurance that we want everybody to have, and then for all the, the second eight, that would be after tax, of whether paid for by the employee or the employer. Now very quickly, people would change their attitude toward health insurance. They would ask, well, what are we getting for our second aid? Do we really want in vitro fertilization and acupuncture and naturopath therapies and other things? Or, or would we rather spend the money on other things? Very quickly, I think you'd find health insurance selling for $8,000. But in any event, I know the market would react, and I think it would react very, very quickly. Secondly, some people aren't going to do this. Some people are going to be uninsured no matter what you offer them. And so when they make that choice, uh, what we need to do is send this credit that they didn't claim to the local community, to safety net institutions. So basically the federal government is offering everybody in America a fixed sum of money and we hope you'll apply it to private health insurance, but you, if you don't, we're going to put it aside in a fund. So if you seek care and you can't pay for it, and you're going to be asked to pay for it, but if you don't have any resources, then there is money there put aside uh, to serve as a safety net. That's universal coverage at least as good as anything Obamacare is, is, is promising, and it's, it's without a mandate. The third thing we need is a generous health savings account. Uh, already, uh, the health savings accounts are really taking off. It's the fastest thing growing in the market today. Uh, 27 million people have either a health savings account or the HRA, which is very similar. Strangely, the Obama administration is about to allow flexible spending accounts to roll over. I don't know how familiar you all are with the flexible spending account. Those are, these are the lose or use it accounts. So you have to spend everything by year end, and if you don't, you lose it. So everybody at year end is rushing out buying things they don't really want or need. I tried, you may not know this, this the use it or lose it feature was never passed by Congress. It was never part of any law. It was just a treasury ruling. So I tried to convince the Bush people to, to overturn that, let, let these accounts roll over. 35 million people have these accounts. You would overnight create 35 million additional health savings account owners. Well, the Bush people thought that was too radical. They didn't want to think about it. Obama's about to do it. Why? Um, I'll tell you why. I think they're desperate, and they know they've tried everything. They know nothing's working. They know these pilot programs and demonstration projects aren't working. They see health costs rising. I bet they got around a table and said, what can we do administratively without asking Congress? And some bright guy said, well, you know, health savings accounts really do work. And the RAND Corporation said they work. And the RAND said they save 30%. And so I think that's what's happening, that, um, that they don't particularly like the idea, but they've tried everything else. Um, fourth, we need a portable insurance. I don't know if all of you know, but uh, in this state, and in my state, and just about every other state, it's illegal for the employer to buy for the employee insurance which the employee owns and can take with him or her from job to job and in and out of the labor market. In other words, you, the employer cannot buy portable insurance for his employees. You can only buy group insurance. You, you, you have to buy Blue Cross group. You cannot buy Blue Cross individual. That virtually ensures we're going to have pre-existing condition problems, right? Because people with a problem are eventually going to move and lose their coverage, and then they're going to have a problem. Uh, this is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. So we need to turn that around, and when you pull people, this is the single biggest problem, the lack of portability that they don't like. And, and I, I, I'm not saying it would be um, easy uh, to solve this problem. You know, it's kind of like... Niagara Falls, you know, two miles before you get to the falls, uh, the water is smooth and calm. And two miles away from the falls, the water is smooth and calm. It's the transition that's the real bitch, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there, uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but this is very, very doable nonetheless. Uh, and finally, we need real insurance. And for me, real insurance is insurance against the, 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 the possibility of getting a pre-existing condition. If I buy life insurance, then I get a prostate cancer test and the results are bad. I don't get kicked out of the pl plan. My premiums aren't raised. Uh, and, and if the cancer kills me, the, uh, my family gets the money. Well, health insurance ought to work the same way. And if you have to switch plans because of this employer-based system, then the old plan ought to pay the higher premium to the new plan, 
caused because there's been a change in health condition. Some people call this health, change of health status insurance. If there's a change in your health status, you have insurance that pays any additional premium that that causes. And uh, that is the most direct way to solve the problem of pre-existing conditions in addition to portability. And it solves it in a way that doesn't distort prices. The name of my book is Priceless. <laughs> and all of our problems are caused because we've suppressed the price system. You want to solve the problems, we've got to allow the price system to exist. We need, to, we need prices in medical care and we need prices in health insurance. Uh, let me just conclude with this thought. Uh, I was introduced as the father of health savings accounts. I'm not sure I deserve that title, but I do think this, that the reason why health savings accounts are so important is, um, is not so much because of the money, it's because of the power. And uh, I've often believed that in healthcare, um, at least from a patient point of view, I don't know how it appears to you, but from a patient point of view, this can be a very bureaucratic system, can be a very unfriendly system, Right now, we have protectors and defenders. Our employer is a protector and defender. The insurance broker is a protector and defender. But if the broker goes away and the employer goes away and it's us against the system and you have problems, uh, you can be in trouble. And so I believe that if you control the money and you have the power to make your own decisions, this system is going to work better for you than if you cede that money and that power to impersonal bureaucracies. Thank you very much.